Yes, hello. Um, I will give the paper presentation since Jan couldn't come, and Christian is busy in the workshop in the next room, so he asked me to present it. Um, so this is a paper that is somewhat similar to the previous one, but tries to be a little bit more generic and uh, not just treat shape notes, but essentially any kind of resources uh, on the web. Um, it, uh, all of this, what I'm presenting now, is really in the context of XML 3D, which is really more than just, just a format. Um, it consists of this extension to HTML5 to describe 3D scenes. But, for instance, it has this generic um, ability to describe data in, in, in general terms, which can then be used for animation or for rendering or for various other purposes. Um, it has an instancing mechanism, which is what uh, Felix will talk about uh, in, the, in the afternoon, a very flexible uh, thing which covers a lot of the use cases um, that uh, uh, templates or, or uh, um, X3D pro, yeah, uh, are. Um, we have Xflow, which was mentioned multiple times for efficient processing and, and also the data model and uh, processing of geometry, animation, and so on. And we also have a new um, approach for shading, which just got accepted for Pacific Graphics, and uh, is something that I think is really interesting. Um, um, and also, we're working on an asset server for storing and providing the data uh, in a flexible way, essentially a, a correspondence to web servers uh, for, for 2D um, content. And, and then last in this context really is a way of efficiently delivering that context from the servers to the client, pretty much uh, addressing the similar issues as, as the previous paper. Um, all of this is really also in the context of XML 3D as, a, um, as an integration or an ecosystem, service-oriented ecosystem. Um, we have a lot of other technologies that we're developing in the context, which is real-time synchronization, augmented reality, and AI navigation in uh, virtual characters in, in things. And actually, there is a, um, there is, um, a workshop, a tutorial, no, a tutorial tomorrow at 9 o'clock in the morning uh, that Torsten will give um, that talks a little bit more about that. That is work that's been doing, that we've been doing in the context of the Future Internet EU projects. It's a huge program run by the European Union, 500 million funding. Um, and um, the XML 3D is one of the our base technologies for that. Uh, but without further ado, let me talk about uh, the, the, the last paper for now. So uh, just let me start with a little background. I mean, we have quite some context from the previous paper already. Um, if you look at what affects the transmission time, uh, the transmission in general, um, for, for assets, there's obviously network bandwidth. And to address that, we can compress, uh, reduce the size of our assets and compress them in various ways. Um, the other important part is network latency. Um, one of the key parts is the slow start of TCP IP, um, and also the number of requests and the overhead by the requests themselves. Um, so we want to reduce the number of requests, uh, total number of requests that we want to do. There's decoding time that was mentioned already. Uh, so that we can address that by, first of all, avoiding the decoding in the first place, was mentioned. But the other thing is actually parallelizing the decoding. I mean, we have multi-core machines these days, so we can address that. And a key part then is also like hiding um, the, the time it takes to transfer content by providing early feedback. And uh, this was also addressed in the previous paper. So provide partial results as early as, as they are available. So regarding compression, um, there's really dozens of approaches in the literature. Um, the key thing, observation from our side that we took into account uh, for BLAST is that compressors are domain specific, right? I mean, there, it depends very much on what you want to do um, if you want to use compression, right? Um, there, there is things that compress geometry taking the texture into account, for instance. Um, that might be necessary for certain kinds of application. And the key part here is, is that there isn't really any solution that uh, fits all of those use cases. We need to be open here um, and um, 
support completely different um, and yet unknown compression technology. So we're not building anything into BLAST itself, but we're providing a very flexible mechanism that can be extended, and I'll talk about this a little bit later. Um, so the, the best solution really then depends on the application, um, also on the device, how powerful that is, and also on the trade-off between the decoding performance of the device versus the network um, bandwidth, for instance. Um, one of the things is we need to be really careful with what we evaluate our things with, right? Um, Buddha is a common object that a lot of papers use in graphics, but it's a very special project, uh, object, right? Uh, it, it's a single object, it's highly detailed, finely tessellated, very regularly tessellated, and depending on which kind of compressor you use, is um, you, you get a kinky, right? It's, it's, I mean, on the other hand, there's, there's things like this here, which in this case uh, actually contains almost 500 meshes, and if you do just one request per mesh, then uh, you're talking about hundreds of requests, and if you, uh, if you think about this, um, uh, that the browser does about six to eight requests in parallel only, then this takes a lot of time. Um, so this becomes a bottleneck, and if you actually look at the, at the um, profiler embedded in the browsers, you see this first line here, this blocking, which simply means that even though the browser has issued the, or put the request into a queue, it's been waiting there, it's been sitting there for 17 seconds just to wait on other requests that have been processed in the meantime. So this is really the longest part of, of the whole thing, is, is sitting there waiting to, 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 for its turn to, to be downloaded, and then actually the rest is really fast. So if you just, if, if we try to visualize this, so a typical scene, right, we have lots of meshes and, and, and group nodes maybe, um, and then Let's say we have a single mesh in each one, and we have to retrieve a lot of uh, single files, your single resources uh, on, on, on the web. Um, and that, that will not be fast. So if you look at common web formats, right, JSON for encoding a mesh, um, we need to do that. OpenCTM also encodes only a single mesh, and so it requires us to do what was in the previous, um, uh, in the previous slide, right, unless we do something like that. Um, it's even so that many formats require not even one request per mesh, but actually multiple. Right? If you, for instance, take JSON with binary uh, references to binary URLs, you could actually look at downloading multiple of those binary buffers uh, per, per JSON mesh or binary geometry, as we heard about of Sigapop, actually does multiple requests uh, by default. Um, also, these were just looking at individual meshes, right? Um, we are also thinking about in maybe downloading the entire scene with all its complex structure um, and, and supporting that with the transfer format, with, with Blast. And if we look for XML3D, right, there is an issue of how to address that. We have IDs and fragments to do that. XML does some GSIP uh, in the browser already. The browser does the parsing for us, but it's not too fast, um, and, and also there is no streaming support by the built-in APIs in the browser. Um, and so, the, and yeah, that's one thing, and then there, there are these binary uh, compressed XML formats, but they don't really fit as we saw before. GLTF, on the other hand, uh, the scene structures we heard uh, are in, is in JSON, and the buff, there's binary containers, actually it's only one in the current implementation currently. Um, we could have multiples, and then there's addressing from the JSON into the binary uh, containers using the URL offset and size. Compressions is handled by a registry mechanism similar to OpenGL, um, so it's, it's kind of a hardwired uh, into that, so not too flexible, and then streaming is, is a little bit more difficult than this. So we, we want to address that. So ideally what we want um, uh, as a possibility is that right, we have a single um, resource here that we're addressing from the complex structured uh, scene description, and um, we can download and stream this um, from the server. But potentially, this is actually you want to be more flexible than that. You don't want to do everything within a single binary, so maybe you just want to aggregate some of them 
and still just reduce the number um, um, just to a reasonable size, uh, the number of binary blocks that you're re retrieving, the number of requests you're, you're taking. So, uh, what's the motivation for BLAST? Um, now that we have set the stage, we want a format that is generic. Um, actually, it just encodes resources that are being sent from the server to the client. It doesn't have any semantics in this, other than um, that they, well, you'll see that in a second. Uh, also, it allows structured uh, data um, and heterogeneous uh, stuff. 3D data is heterogeneous, so we need to be able to support that and the deeply structured, uh, um, uh, uh, the deeply structured uh, character of, of 3D data. Um, so streamable um, is is important, as we uh, as we saw, and then support for arbitrary compression. So let's look at this in a little bit more detail. So the the, the whole idea is uh, we take JSON as the basis. Um, we add support for typed arrays by essentially similar as the previous paper, have binary data uh, in, in our transfer format, and we add addressing for the structure, for supporting the structured data. Essentially, the center starts by taking, conceptually taking a JavaScript object, um, and for each of the elements recursively in that uh, JavaScript object, it applies compression to each of the elements. Um, whatever is suitable uh, for that thing. That's something that the server decides, maybe based on data that the client has said. Um, that compression produces a binary block, um, and we also uh, associate um, a, the encoder that was used to generate that using a URL. Then all of that is being flattened, uh, and it's possibly being ordered by the server and it's packed into different chunks that are then uh, sequentially sent um, in, in BLAST. And you'll see this in a second. And we add a header for each of these chunks. And then the reader, uh, on the receiver side, we, right, we receive the individual chunks. We decode the individual uh, blocks um, into the elements that we started with in the beginning. Um, we potentially, if we don't have the encoder, the URL that is encoding, or is telling us which encoder was being used, actually points to the source code that we can download. If we don't have a, uh, have a native implementation of that, we can actually download a standard JavaScript version um, and, and essentially deal with arbitrary encoded stuff here. And then we, we take the individual elements, and since we have the paths and we know how this uh, is made up into the original object, we can, we can put the original object together. So how does this look uh, in more detail? Um, so uh, the, the file format or the, the, the stream format, data format, is we again have a preamble to identify that this is BLAST. Then we have a set of chunks uh, ending with an empty chunk indicating that this is the end of stream and each chunk has a header. Um, the preamble actually says how the header is encoded. Um, currently we're using JSON here, unencoded un 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 binary. Uh, text format of JSON, and then after the header, there's the payload, which is the binary data. You can have multiple of those blocks. An important part here for these blocks is that the server doesn't have to know, have to have, doesn't have to uh, process the entire scene first before it can put together uh, the, the file. So it can take pieces of the, of the data set, uh, encode it into a separate chunk, and send this off as soon as, as it's ready, um, and then keep working on the other parts of the scene, for instance. If you, we look at this a little bit in more detail, then the header of each chunk essentially specifies for each part of the chunk, of the binary chunk, uh, for each part of that, um, what is the decoder for that, um, and where this goes into the final reconstructed um, object. Um, so we have a path name that indicates uh, where, where this goes into the result. So essentially what we do is we grab the responsive part of the binary block from the chunk, um, we decode that, give them the decoder, and then we attach the resulting object, which might actually be a structured object itself, into, uh, into, the, target, uh, into the target object that is the result of reading this last stream. Um, 
So the whole scheme, we didn't talk about geometry, textures, animation, figure, anything like that. It's just resources. And this fits really, really well with the generic data format that uh, we have used in XML3D, and in particular Xflow um, uses that for, for the processing. Actually, we use Xflow for, some, for, for configuring some of the decoding pipelines that are being used here. So we can handle arbitrary, hierarchically aggregated object, and this is not actually limited to JavaScript. Um, we can actually have decoders running in different languages as well. Potentially, we haven't implemented this yet. Blast itself is typeless by design. Um, it only knows about those binary blobs, um, hands them over to a decoder, and then the result is put together again um, uh, later on. And uh, only minimal meta information is really given. Um, the, the, location where the binary data is, the decoder, and where to put the result. And that's actually very compressible data in itself. It's probably, it's usually not too too big anyway, but um, I did dig the path. Uh, they share a lot of the same prefixes, um, and the decoders are, uh, are probably a handful of decoders that will be used to they can all index into the same streams. Um, uh, we support arbitrarily nested structured data. Uh, essentially, we consider the scene consisting of a hierarchical key value data structure like JSON, um, where we have uniquely identified path through that data structure. Um, we, in last, we use this um, path uh, uh, to address the individual sub resources, and they can come in arbitrary order. Um, and so, even if we send a deeply nested part of the structure first. We, we know where to place it in, in this com possibly complex object that we haven't really, that we don't know yet, right? We, but the path tells us where, where to put things and how to reconstruct the intermediate nodes in this hierarchy. Um, right, and then this path is really similar to X path. Uh, it includes addressing for arrays and things like that. So it supports all the things that JSON operations need. Um, we have this chunk based streaming. So each Chunk is completely self-contained. It uh, can be produced in parallel on the server. It can be decoded in parallel um, on the client. It contains all of the information to decode uh, the data that it contains. Um, as I said, can be done in parallel on the client and the server. And the server can also cache this. So if, let's say, you have a popular scene somewhere running in your or stored on the asset server, right? Uh, the server can uh, cache those pieces for instance, and reorder them depending, right? Maybe you decode small pieces of your of your scene, and uh, then you deliver them based on the current camera position, right? To, to have the stuff that's close uh, sent this early or um, sent different parts of uh, uh, progressive geometry in different orders. Um, yes, and then we can put the blocks together into a single chunk. Actually, we can do the parallel processing even on the block layer. Um, uh, because they, they are independent. We're completely encoder agnostic, right? We don't really, I mean, Blast doesn't know about the encoder, it just knows there is code there. Either we know the URL, um, in which case we can use a native implementation um, that uh, is, uses whatever OpenCL or uh, whatever else, and maybe an optimized JavaScript with ASM.js or something like that. Um, but if we don't know about this, we simply grab the encoder, we run it um, locally, so we call this code on demand here. Um, also, when we grab the encoder, sorry, the decoder, then we could even ask for different sort, different types of decoders, right? We can ask for a JavaScript version or maybe a C++ version of that if, if, we, have, if we wanted to do that in C++. Um, or we can ask for a JavaScript version of the decoder that uses WebCL. We can do that through the content encoding when we request the decoder. Um, and then the decoding is actually done in parallel in web, uh, uh, in, in, in web workers, and um, it's also sandboxed off in, 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 uh, so, uh, for, for security and as well as parallelism. So the whole thing is um, very versatile. Uh, we support any of the transmission formats. Uh, you can use Blast even for a single mesh if you want to. Um, we can have multiple meshes in blocks, then right, uh, and have each one, I don't know, a 
10, 25 of those meshes in, in, in separate files um, and uh, grab them separately if we want to, or we can put everything into one large file. We could even put the entire scene, including the XML3D file that kind of describes the structure of the scene uh, into, into the same blast container, um, as long as we know what, what to start with, uh, which is easily encodable. Um, and then, um, let's say all the references would be relative and they would essentially ref refer to this path space, that, um, the namespace described by the path to, to find the resources uh, in the blast stream. So, uh, in terms of results, uh, since Christian wanted to do the presentation originally, uh, the demo actually runs on his laptop, so if you want to see that, please see him uh, with his laptop in the break or in the lunch. Uh, it, uh, I don't have this installed here, so I'll just report on some of the statistics here. Uh, first of all, there's very minimal overhead. Um, let me zoom into this here a little bit more. So what you see here is uh, the Sponsa Atrium with textures. Actually, in this scene, most of the data is texture data, similar to uh, the previous paper here. So if we use OpenCTM, for instance, we don't really see much compression because most of the data is actually in textures. And also, like in last, it um, doesn't reduce anymore right? because we have to transfer that. The key thing here is if we use, so this is using BLAST where we encoded each match separately uh, in a BLAST stream, so um, we don't really see much advantages here and we don't expect them to see. And um, we, we show the differences here between a six, me six megabit, let's say DSL connection and a one gigabit uh, local area connection here, which is obviously quite, quite a bit faster. Um, the second row here is the aggregated, where we um, put four meshes into, uh, into one container. Um, so you see that we, um, here on the, on the six megabit, that doesn't really help much. Um, but on the one gigabit connection, that helps a lot already, um, essentially the overhead here. I mean, we're essentially bandwidth limited on the six megabit, so the, the, the additional latency doesn't really, uh, doesn't really show up. Um, and then if we put everything into one, a single blast stream, then this is highly uh, efficient. It's, it's a little bit smaller here, a little bit faster, um, and um, it's much, much faster um, on the one gigabit connection. I mean, it's, I don't know, six times faster than, uh, for instance, transferring the individual meshes, even if we use blast for the meshes themselves. Um, the, the second scene here on the right um, is mostly geometry. And so it compresses, obviously compresses much better, in particular if we use the impact uh, geometry compression technique, which then obviously helps dramatically in this case because we essentially only have geometry. Helps, lot, uh, helps a lot uh, with, the, with the bandwidth here. Um, and uh, if we use less um, uh, blocks here to less requests to load the scene, um, again, we see quite a bit of improvements here, but again, on the one gigabit connection, here we're again bandwidth limited. And um, if we put this all together, um, again, this is like the best method, best possible method for transfer of those sensors. Um, it's also important to note that we're, that uh, glass really is just a container format. And here we just use some of the existing geometry compression techniques like OpenCTM or the MPEG um, uh, stuff. And essentially what we're doing here is we're overcoming their limitations like OpenCTM can only compress a single, only represent and compress a single mesh. But we can put, put each of those meshes into blocks and transfer them in one, in one piece. Um, and, and we overcome those limitations uh, this way. Um, also they have predefined schemas. I mean they, they can only represent essentially a single mesh for instance or certain data associated with it. Um, and typically they're essentially more or less structureless, but we can put them into a larger and complex structure scene here. Um, we have transparent uh, decoding, really, if we, if we look at this in a little bit more detail here. So we have a server, some host language, it does its processing, it compresses, uh, for instance, the individual pieces, put them into BLAST, and then sends it through HTTP. Um, so the client doesn't really care where the data comes from as long as the same structure that the host language, which might be completely different language, 
um, it, 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 the structure of the object is, is being reconstructed. Um, if we just use BLAST itself um, during the encoding, um, we everything's transparent, and at the end we just get the resource. We might get multiple versions of the resource as progressive data comes in, right? Um, and so this might cause re-renderings and things like this, but if we use BLAST directly, transparently, then we don't really know about this. Um, however, for some things, if you want to do LOD management and, and things like that, the client can actually uh, plug into the BLAST uh, reconstruction or like, the downloading part and know about the different pieces as they come in and then uh, right, do whatever it wants to do in terms of when to render what and when uh, how to deal with the individual pieces as they are coming in. So this is this short circuit um, link that we have here. Um, the client doesn't have to do that, right? Then he just gets the resources, but, but it can if it wants to. Um, right. So what are the limitations of BLAST? Um, we don't, there, there's the standard limitation for streaming of binary data. Um, there is something in Firefox now, and there's the Streams API, so this will hopefully take care of this, and this is true for all of, all of the solutions. Um, we simulated this more or less with WebSockets um, for, for the measurements that, that we showed here. Um, so in conclusion, we are addressing all of the different aspects that I started with in the beginning, so network, network bandwidth, we have these very, very different, um, possibly arbitrary compression techniques that we can use. The class is essentially agnostic to what compression technology we're using here. So adding new ones is easily possible. This helps research, but uh, possibly also in other use cases. Um, let's say the very domain-specific compression techniques that might be uh, required for certain uh, usage domains of 3D data. Uh, we're uh, supporting complex structured data. We can compress the entire scene with all of its structure in uh, a single last uh, instance if we want to, but we don't have to, right? If you want to do it different pieces, that's fine too. Um, and so with encoding large parts, um, maybe sending only a single request, uh, that helps network latency. Decoding times, uh, we can parallelize that Either we can avoid it, the same approach as in the previous papers, or we get the binary data directly, we can download it to the GPU. Um, if we have to decode, then we can parallelize the number per threads per chunk and actually per block as well. And then, uh, because it's a streamable format, as soon as we get notification that more data has arrived, we can start uh, showing this. This essentially the client then has to uh, plug into the uh, uh, into this shortcut that I showed earlier. Yes, with that, thank you very much for listening, and I'm uh, happy to take any questions that you have. Thanks a lot. And again, uh, for demos, please talk to Christian. He can show that and run this on the side. Yeah, thanks for a very interesting talk. Um, may I return a quick question if you have integrated this into XML 3D, if you have um, an application that manipulates, let's say, vertex positions, user drags around uh, the certain surface, some part of it, um, how does this play together? Do you have an interface to access the um, already decoded data in your decorated framework uh, somehow? Yes, actually, uh, Felix will talk about this in the session after, after lunch. Uh, we have this uh, new instancing mechanism. You can overload and, and manipulate different pieces. As well as, as I said, we, we can actually implement the decoding parts here in uh, XFlow pipelines. And any element in, in those XFlow pipelines is actually accessible. Um, and you can, you can, for instance, change the animation parameters and things like that. This probably will become more apparent in, uh, after the presentation. Thank you. Some more questions. Okay. Yeah, the first one is if I answer correctly, it's also kind of container. Yes. How do you get data into this container? 
um, say, CityGMA or GeoStation data to come from a view of uh, any of the data? It, well, you can just take it as it is, um, right? Take the string encoding of CityGML and put this as it is into this blob and say, no decoder, right? And um, then we will not compress it, but it's as easy as just copying it in, into the data set, essentially. If you, want, if, if you want to kind of look at the individual pieces, then essentially your server has to run over the city GML structure and maybe do encode them in, in different, well, in the first case, you would have to run a city GML parser on the client. As soon as the data comes in, then the client would have to parse this. So you might not want that, right? So what you could do instead is on the server, uh, convert that into binary blobs for the vertex data and things like that, uh, encode them with OpenCTM or whatever. Uh, the MPEG uh, actually gives very good results. Um, and then stream those pieces maybe as resources that um, are linked to from an XML 3D scene representation. But in theory, we could actually have uh, GLTF, um, the JSON, as our, our easily support uh, GLTF with the same mechanisms as well. It's, it's re it's, it's a, I think that's a key part. It's really a container format for packing up resources, being able to compress this differently for each of the different resources, and making these resources available on the client. How they are being used there is, is pretty much up to the application. And essentially, we reconstruct a JavaScript object that may be as arbitrarily complex. could be an entire scene graph. Um, and the second question. Yes, sorry. <laughs> so the second question is my impression was that Jason appeared in the new condition in the presentation before. Uh, so, so there seems to be a fundamental concept about the Do you have any experience with the new Jason? So this new extension is because it has some problems with being sorted. We, we don't care about the semantics, right? We only transfer a hierarchically structured format on, or object format on one side into the same thing on the other side. And it could actually come from a C++ complex link structured on, on the one side and then we reconstruct a, a similar JSON object or, or a JavaScript object actually. It doesn't have to become a string. It could be the, the JavaScript object itself on the client already. Um, and we don't interpret the data in any way. Right? We can link to this, for it, right? If, if, if it's a binary buffer, we can directly link to it from an XML 3D scene description, in, in which case it gets downloaded to the GPU and just used for rendering. But you could run whatever you want with that resource. Uh, We're running out of time. Thank you very much, Philip. Thanks.